悩んだんだ考えたんだ苦しんだんだだから諦めたんだ諦めるのだって簡単なんかじゃなかった戦おうってどうにかしてやろうってそう思う方がずっと楽だったよだけどどうにもならないんだよ道がどこにもないんだ諦める道にしか続いてないんだ力なんてないのに望みは高くて知恵もないくせに夢ばかり見ててできることなんてないのに無駄にあがいて俺は俺は俺が大嫌いだよ Mori Buntaro is like a lot of us. After transferring to a new high school, everyone can clearly see that this quiet, reserved, and disinterested new student doesn't care for class or making friends. And some students try to take advantage of that. Miyamoto, a student climber, pushes Mori around, claiming he's just acting up to get attention. He tells him he'll leave him alone if he climbs up the side of the school. Of course, Miyamoto doesn't expect Mori to really do it, and if he does, to not get far at all and quit, frustrated and embarrassed, ultimately his end goal. But as he watches Mori start scaling the building, those thoughts of humiliating him vanish. Climbing up and up, Mori doesn't quite understand what he's doing or why he's doing it, but his body moves nonetheless. He comes face to face with an overhang, the likes of which even Miyamoto wouldn't try for without a harness like Mori is doing now, the kind of jump that would kill you if you failed. Call it a disregard for his life, unwavering determination, or perhaps both, but Mori leapt. And as he surged forward, alone, as he reached for the sky's embrace, it is only when his scraped hands grip upon that ledge that a particular energy and excitement surges through his body. For the first time ever, Mori finally feels alive. He is infatuated with this feeling, laying on the roof of the school building and looking up at the sky as if his hands can, for once, actually bring him somewhere, can pull him out of this hole in life and allow him to reach heights where no one else can touch him. After, Onishi sensei, who teaches Miyamoto climbing, sees this feat from Mori and asks him to climb more and practice with them. But Mori doesn't need things like friends. Still, Mori can't escape that feeling of melting into the sky, of freeing himself from the shackles of society. He keeps climbing. And despite Mori's insistence to be alone, Onishi sensei continues to encourage him, showing him to nearby mountains and feeding off the budding excitement he senses in Mori. He pushes him to join a rock climbing competition. He gives him climbing shoes. He opens up a new rock climbing club at school. He watches as that new student who did the overhang finds purpose, a place he can climb to and discover a new self. But as we read further, Mori continues to become more and more infatuated with the idea of solo climbing. Often regarded as suicide to most professionals, climbing alone has allowed the mountains to claim an endless number of lives, leaving their fallen bodies upon the heights to become a frozen, eternal memory of the life that once was. The mountain is a place where you must be ready to give up your life. But the stories from Onishi Sensei and other climbers somehow do not dissuade Mori, who seems to have a death wish to them all. Why does he desire it so much? Have you ever felt so alone that you believed that separating yourself from people entirely, rejecting connections, and telling yourself you don't need them would make that crippling loneliness go away? That the pain of losing a friend, being bullied, falling hopelessly in love, that none of it would happen if you left it all behind. If you never made that friend, never spoke or acted to draw the attention of those bullies, closed yourself off from even thinking you needed or deserved love to keep yourself away from heartbreak. This is slowly revealed to be how Mori thinks, and the sad thing is that I can perfectly understand him. I'm sure many introverted people here can, the pain of hope. Hoping that you have a chance at making those connections, but after failure and failure again, feeling that pushing that hope away will just make it all a bit less painful. 
In these cases, it is often through hobbies and passions that we can still find meaning. For me, in high school, it was anime. The relationships I had were with the characters on the screen, the stories they wove. At a point in my life, I was absorbing myself in these endless fictional worlds where I could forget the pain of the one I really lived in. For Mori, that's what climbing is. Where all of the dirty and unpleasant things of the world below get washed away in the pure whiteness of the snowy mountaintops. The climber's story evolves in a very interesting way, most notably the remarkable thematic shift following Volume 3. Everything I've described so far of the story is actually remarkably different in tone from the majority of this psychological seinen story. The Climber was originally a collaboration between the writer Nabeda Yoshiro and artist Shinichi Sakamoto. Nabeda, however, left at the time at the end of the third volume due to creative differences, leaving Sakamoto in charge of both the writing and the art. This part of the climber experiences what's called Cerebus Syndrome. Coined by Eric Burns White based on the comic book Cerebus the Aardvark, it's when a story or series starts out light, episodic, and comedic, and suddenly assumes dramatic elements and a more coherent continuity. In the climber, a tried and true sports manga at first, a young, lonely prodigy found by a teacher who believes in him and a rival classmate who can push him, joining the school club with the cute club manager, quickly and completely shifts into the psychological and introspective character study that it's now famous for. At this point in Volume 3, we also see a key subplot involving a friend's suicide in Mori's earlier life that's completely dropped, which was presumably set up by the former writer Nabeda. Characters from the early story who reappear after the third volume all have their character development go in completely unexpected directions as well. This change, however, isn't as abrupt or disruptive as it seems on surface level. In fact, it lines up very well with the story's continuity. Up until this point, Mori slowly let others get close. He learned alongside Miyamoto, came to appreciate and listen to Onishi's advice. The finale of Volume 3 destroys that. It marks a moment where Mori's belief that he only brings harm to those around him and only serves to inflict pain on himself by letting others get close proves to be true once again. That any hope he had of it not being so is crushed. To match this, Sakamoto's art becomes much darker and more consistent, making the story after Volume 3 feel like an entirely different manga. But this is one of the very few times where I feel that the story benefited greatly from the original writer departing, as this is where the climber truly begins and cements itself as one of the best. It introduces the Doom Magnet, a trope that is often shared among the most popular seinen manga. Let me explain. Suffering in fiction, manga especially, commonly manifests so that, no matter what the protagonist does, they only bring harm to people who try to get close. Berserk, one of the most obvious and famous examples, pits guts against enemies night after night. They quite literally will kill anyone near and around guts, the sacrifice. This can also manifest in the form of repenting for one's guilt, as in Vinland Saga where Thorfinn feels that, after all the people he's killed and the blood he has spilt, he can only bring harm to people around him. Look all around us in all kinds of fictional works. Batman and the death of Robin. Frodo carrying the ring of power alone. Dr. Frankenstein and his creation. These ideas perpetuate the trope of the Doom Magnet, a protagonist who inevitably brings and attracts doom to his friends, loved ones, and even someone he makes the slightest form of contact with to some kind of wretched fate or death. The Climber is no exception, and similar to Vinland Saga, this takes shape in the form of Survivor's Guilt. Throughout Mori's story, he has shown time and time again that his attempts to hold people close to him, or more often the case when he falls into situations where he must be close to people despite his rejection of it, will result in their deaths leaving him as the only one to continue on. The ones who survive are made to carry the heavy burdens of the dead. 
The fact that he doesn't choose to be in these situations makes the feeling of guilt even stronger as well. Mori feels like, no matter how hard he even tries to avoid these situations, he can't escape them, and people will still suffer. But one of the greatest parts about these stories of suffering is the redemption. It is the moment where the characters finally find someone who not only remains by their side and wears away at the binds of the Doom Magnet, but someone who accepts the character for who they are as well. Our Samwise Ganges, our Gudrids. The reason these characters get so much rise out of us as fans, readers, consumers, is our innate desire to find that partner of our own or if we already have one, to be grateful for them. Someone who provides unwavering support and reminds us that perhaps this feeling is worth the pain I've experienced up until now. The real theme of The Climber is that no matter how hard you try to run away from people, you can never escape. No man can ever truly be alone, an island unto himself. But some people make that suffering worth it. The Climber is an incredible story of pain, suffering, crippling, loneliness, and of redemption. For anyone who feels like they aren't enough, or that the struggle to make connections and keep relationships just feels like failure time and time again, I think you might find solace and perhaps hope in this story. A hope that doesn't disappear. And if you don't feel that way, I imagine this beautifully drawn and written manga might still give you a story that'll change your life. As always, this has been the Anime Culture Corner. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe for future in-depth show manga and character analyses.